When photographing birds, I want to capture the sharpest images with the highest possible quality. To do this, I need a well-exposed image. A good exposure is created using three camera settings, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. The key for any photographer is understanding what these settings do, which combination to use, and why. In today's video, I'll attempt to explain just that. All right, the first setting we're gonna talk about is your aperture. Inside your lens are some aperture blades, and these blades control how much light enters the lens and hits your sensor. So as the aperture number gets bigger, the blades close in and less light can hit your sensor. Let's start with the f-stop. You'll see this number written on your lens. This tells us the maximum aperture. That is your widest aperture setting or the lowest aperture number. This lets in the most amount of light. So as you can see with my 500 f4, f4 is the max aperture. With the blade wide open, it lets in the most light. As we stop down or close the aperture, the number gets bigger and the amount of light hitting the sensor reduces. This can be confusing at first, as the lower the F number, the bigger the opening in the lens. So the obvious question is, why don't we just leave our aperture at its widest or its maximum setting and let in as much light as we can? Well, there's two main reasons why we don't use our maximum aperture. First reason is that lenses aren't their sharpest wide open. So what do I mean by that is if your maximum aperture is say 5.6, the images are sharpest between say 7.1 and 9. The second main factor which aperture controls is your depth of field. So I talked all about this in my smooth background video, but if you look at the graphic on the screen, you can see that the depth of field is our area in focus. The lower that aperture number, the narrower that area of focus will be. And this can cause issues, as you can see with this superb fairy ring on the screen. The depth of field on this image was 6.3, and it was just too narrow, which has resulted in the perch and the tail of the bird being out of focus. And we don't want that. We want all of the bird and all of the perch in focus if we can. If we use a higher aperture number, our depth of field increases, so more of the bird and the perch will be in focus. And as you can see with this next shot, it was shot at f8, and much more of the perch and the bird are in focus. And this is a better overall image in my opinion. So for wildlife, for the sharpest possible images, I would recommend using an aperture between 7.1 and 9. This will ensure you've got adequate depth of field and the sharpest possible images. All right, I think it's a good time that we chat about a stop of light. And what does a stop of light even mean? You've probably heard me use the word stop, open it up by a stop, close it by a stop to stop a light, you've heard this over and over again and you may be wondering what exactly that means. So a stop of light is either doubling or halving the amount of light that's hitting the sensor. I know that's confusing, but let's have a look at this chart. So this is your aperture going from F4 to F22. So at F4, we're wide open. So if we move one stop to F5.6, this lets in half the amount of light. So 5.6 is half. If we then went up to F8, that's another half of light that we've lost. And so overall now we've lost two stops, only letting in a quarter of the amount of light that F4 was. And as you can see on that chart, as, we, as that aperture goes from F8, F11, F16, we're losing more and more light. And it works the other way as well. So if we're going from F8 up to F5.6, we've doubled the amount of light that's available. And from 5.6 to 4 is double the light. So whenever we work in stops, it's either halving or doubling the amount of light that's available to take a photo. This will make more sense as we go, because each camera setting, your ISO aperture and shutter speed, all work in stops, and they either double or half the amount of light. So most cameras are set to work in a third of a stop increments. What do I mean by that? Well, if you turn the dial on your camera, let's say we're at, say, 5.6, and we turn the dial, it would go 5.6, 6.3, 7.1, and then 8. So 5.6 to 8 is one stop, but 5.6 to 6.3 is a third, 7.1 is another third, and then obviously F8. And you can see on the chart, we've got the full stops, and then we've got the third of the stop increments. And the reason we work in third of the stop increments is it just gives you finer control. Sometimes one stop can just be too much. It can make it either too bright or too dark, and one third allows us a gradual change in the exposure, which often works better. So obviously as we change our aperture number and less light is coming in, this is gonna directly impact our shutter speed because we can't have the same shutter speed if we don't have the amount of light available. So at F4, at an ISO of 100, a base ISO, we had a shutter speed of 1 2000, but I changed that to 5.6, so we moved one stop. So one stop in the shutter speed is half the light, so we've gone 1 2000 down to 1 1000. 
And as you can see, as we move down that chart, we go by stop each time, our shutter speed is halving at each stop. So if we were at F11, we'd only have a shutter speed of 1 2 50th, and that's just too slow often for wildlife, especially if you're trying to capture a flying bird. So you just have to be aware of that when setting your aperture that you have still have adequate shutter speeds. And as you can see on that chart, we've got this pelican. When we're down at our widest aperture, the background is quite smooth. But as we stop down, we can see that the background becomes more in focus as our depth of field increases. So I've started at an aperture of f9. As we open up the aperture and we let in more light, you can see that the scene gets brighter. And if we go from f9, close down the aperture, you can see the scene gets darker, which is logical because we're getting either more or less light. All right, let's move on to the second setting, and that's just shutter speed. Most people are pretty confident with their shutter speed and they understand, so I'll quickly go through this. Basically, at the front of your sensor and your camera is a shutter mechanism. We have a top curtain and a bottom curtain. When you hit the shutter, these two curtains go block the light from hitting the sensor. And depending on how long your shutter speed is, let's say it was one second, as we hit the shutter, the bottom curtain will drop and one second later, the top curtain will drop. And the amount, of, the amount of time that your shutter speed is set for is the amount of time that these curtains open and close, letting light hit your sensor. So as you can imagine, the faster the shutter speed, the less light that is able to actually come through and hit your sensor. The impact of that is the higher the shutter speed, we freeze the action, which is logical because if you think about it, if we leave the shutter open for a second, there's a lot that can happen in a second which can cause motion blur and blurry photos. So with wildlife, we want the fastest shutter speeds we can get. But as those shutter speeds go up, the amount of light goes down, which can cause us issues when it comes to trying to get a good exposure. Here's a photo I took of a king penguin coming out of the water. I really wanted to freeze the water as the penguin emerged from the ocean and I actually used the fastest possible shutter speed I could, which was 1 8,000th of a second. And by taking that photo, I managed to really freeze the action, which makes this photo. If I used a much slower shutter speed, the water would be quite blurry and even the bird might not have been as sharp. So that's one technique we have when photographing birds is to use high shutter speeds to freeze the action. With static birds, I try to keep my shutter speed over 1 400th of a second. And with moving birds or flying birds, I generally try and keep it above 1600th of a second shutter speed. So we have a look on the screen, a very simple diagram here that shows you the slower the shutter speeds, you may get motion blur. And as you can see, as our shutter speed increases, the amount of light reaching the sensor decreases, but we get to freeze the action. So that's the balance that we're looking for. So a rule of thumb has always been, whatever your focal length is, your shutter speed shouldn't be any lower than that. So if you've got a 400 millimeter lens, ideally your shutter speed shouldn't be any lower than 1 400th of a second. This isn't a hard rule and it's just a guide to try and prevent camera shake and motion blur. So just quickly the difference between camera shake and motion blur. Motion blur is when the bird moves. So as you can see with this fairy wren, the head has moved at the time I've taken the photo and it's blurry. But if we look at the feet, the feet are sharp and the perch is sharp. So only the birds moved. If we have camera shake, the whole image will be blurry or soft. And the higher the shutter speed will reduce the amount of camera shake or the issues that come with that. I took another shot that had a really low shutter speed, but this time the bird's sharp because it wasn't moving. The other thing is it is important to know that you can actually capture sharp shots at really low shutter speeds. Have a look at the satin bowbird. I actually photographed this with 1 40th of a second shutter speed, which is ridiculously low. But because I was steady, I was on a tripod, the bird hasn't moved, I fired off a number of shots at once and a number of them were sharp. The issue is, is that by using such low shutter speeds, the amount of sharp shots drastically reduces. You'll still get them, the amount of soft shots will <laughs> increase. So it's a real balance. So using low shutter speeds is definitely one technique you can use if you're in a rainforest. You can get away with low shutter speeds and by using lower shutter speeds, you can use lower ISO numbers. So back to the stops of light that we were talking about. If we have a look at the diagram, shutter speeds are fairly simple to understand. One stop is basically doubling your shutter speed. So we go 125th, 250, 500, 1000 and so on. And at each stop, we're halving the amount of light that's hitting the sensor. So our current shutter speed has the correct exposure. And as we increase our shutter speed, the scene gets darker because it's faster and there's less light hitting the sensor. As we lower our shutter speed, it's obviously the shutter's open for longer and we get more light, the scene gets brighter. So as we saw, as we increase our shutter speed, the amount of light hitting the sensor reduces and the scene gets darker. So how do we make it brighter? How do we keep those higher shutter speeds? Well, the answer is your ISO. 
Simply, by increasing your ISO, it makes the scene brighter. Your camera requires less light to expose the photo. So your ISO basically amplifies the light hitting the sensor and it no longer needs as much light. So what does that mean? Well, it means as you increase your shutter speed, you can increase the ISO to keep the exposure the same. So simply with wildlife, if you want higher shutter speeds, you just simply increase your ISO. So if you're in auto ISO mode and you put up your shutter speed, your ISO will go up by the same amount. So you might be thinking, oh, how good's this? We just simply increase, keep increasing our ISO to get the shutter speeds we want. Well, you can, but the trade-off with higher ISO is a reduced image quality and more noise. I did a whole video on noise, which you're free to watch. It becomes a point where your ISO is just too high and each camera will be different. With my 5D Mark IV, I generally go up to say ISO 6400, but I prefer to use 3200 or 1600. And it all depends on how bright the scene is and how much light is available. Let's have a look at the screen. Here's three superb Fourier ends, all photographed at three different ISO settings. So you can see the one on the left is ISO 3200 and the one in the middle is ISO 1600. So the higher the number, the more grain and the less image quality. But the 5D Mark IV is such a good camera, it is very hard to tell the difference between 1600 and 3200. If I'd shot this, say, on my old 7D, there'd be a lot more noise in these images. So the newer cameras handle noise a lot better. Let's have a look at that superb Ferrin on the right. Can you see how much noise is in this image, how grainy it is, and it just lacks contrast, and the bird just doesn't look very good. And that's because I used an ISO of 32,000, which is really, really high and one I would never recommend, but I just wanted to demonstrate what noise is and what happens when you really push your ISO out. Interestingly though, I actually processed that photo using Topaz Denoise in Photoshop. I did a review on Topaz, some extra software that reduces noise, and it actually came up not too bad considering the high ISO and would almost be passable for a web version image. So your ISO works very similar to your aperture and shutter speed. It's slightly different though, your aperture and your shutter speed, they both control their light before it hits your sensor. Your ISO is controlling how the sensor uses the light that's coming in. If we go from ISO 100 to 200, that's one stop. Your sensor requires half the amount of light. If we then go to 200 to 400, it halves the amount of light it needs again, and so on and so on. So as you can see, when we get out to say ISO 1600, the sensor requires 1 16th the amount of light that it originally did. And that's quite a big difference. And that gives us a lot of flexibility when it comes to our aperture and our shutter speed. Because if the camera only needs 1 16th of the amount of light, we can then bump up the shutter speed by the same amount. The ISO is basically a big help to wildlife photographers. As we increase our ISO, the camera requires less and less light. This crested turn shot, let's say the aperture was set at f8 and we had an ISO of 100, would give us a shutter speed of 1 500th of a second. And as we double the ISO, we double the shutter speed all the way down to ISO 1600 would give us a shutter speed of 1 8,000th of a second. So as you can see, there's a direct relationship between your ISO and your shutter speed. And as mentioned before, if you're working in auto ISO, you just simply increase the shutter speed and your camera will match with the ISO increase. A very important point that I want to make is you can use numerous different settings to get the same exposure. So let's take a look at this beach stone curly photo I photographed many years ago. I had bright direct sunlight and I knew I wanted fast shutter speeds to freeze the action. I was using the original 7D at the time and I found ISO 400 gave me the cleanest files with that camera. So I've overlaid six exposure options that will all result in the same exposure or brightness. Have a look at each combination. Maybe pause the video and have a guess at which combination you think I chose for the 7D. Think about each setting. We want the sharpest photo with good depth of field. We want a shutter speed to freeze the action and we want an ISO that doesn't produce too much noise for this old crop sensor camera. What did you come up with? I actually went with combination number one. At the time, I was too concerned with noise, so I didn't want to go above ISO 400. 7.1 and 2000 gave me a good shutter speed and gave me adequate depth of field. Now, if I was to shoot the same scene with my 5D Mark IV, I can obviously bump up that ISO by quite a bit. Let's just say that I bumped it up to ISO 800. That would now give me a shutter speed of 3200 and an aperture of f8, which is probably what I would use, and that would result in a really nice photo. Let's have a look at combinations three to six. 
Can you see any issues with those settings in relation to wildlife? What may lead to some problem? So I'll overlay what I believe are the issues. So in red are the settings which I would avoid for wildlife and green is the settings that I would suggest. If we have a look at combination four, the aperture is good, f8, so that'll lead to a nice sharp photo with a good depth of field, but the shutter speed of 400th of a second is just far too slow and will likely lead to motion blur. Now the reason we have such a slow shutter speed is we've actually set the ISO to 100, which is the highest image quality and requires the most amount of light. If we have a look at the image of the Beachstone Curly, it would, it would probably look like this. That is, the bird is blurry. I think that's a really important point. You, the photographer, can control these three settings and you've got to make sure you're picking the right setting for that situation. So what settings should we use? Well, as I've mentioned in previous videos, it all depends how bright your scene is. The brighter your scene, the more light that's available, so the higher your shutter speeds can be and lower your ISO. If we have a look at this chart, any scene will be dark, medium or bright, so rainforests, overcast, direct sunlight, and the settings you will use will change depending on how bright your scene is. Ultimately, a good exposure is a balance of these three settings, and it's up to the photographer to determine what these settings are. I actually think this is a really fun part of photography and it's actually a very creative process because you get to change the settings, see how they impact a photo and just have a play around. We won't all use the same settings all the time. Two photographers could use completely different settings depending on what they're going for. And I just implore you to get out there and have a go. It's the only way you'll really learn exactly what these settings are doing is by having a go yourself. I'm just gonna quickly tell you how I set my exposure um, in manual mode. I'm currently in my front yard. I've got some fairy wrens jumping around here. It's the sun's pretty much disappeared, so very low light. I've just played around with my settings. At the moment, what I'm gonna go with is ISO 6400 F8, which gives me a 500th of a second. That should be fast enough handheld. So those, that ISO is pretty high, but I like to have that depth of field as mentioned with the aperture and that shutter speed should be high enough. So now I've just gotta wait for the bird to pop up. I've taken my test shot, I've checked my histogram, and my histogram's looking good. So all we need now is a bird. on top of this tree here, on top of this bush. So he's just up on here. What I'm trying to do is just change the settings based on the light that's available to try and get the best quality shot I can. So in these changing scenarios, you know, I was at ISO 6400 and I dropped down to 3200 because the light's actually improved. Um, I dropped my aperture to 7.1 to get the shutter speeds up and I was just playing around as I went. There's no hard or fast settings that you have to use every time. It's up to you to try heaps of different settings and just see which ones work best for you. You know, different cameras handle ISO differently and that's the joy of getting out and photographing birds and whatnot. If you like this content, please give it a thumbs up. If you've got any questions, leave them below. I'll answer every single one. If you want to see more of this type of content, please subscribe. I appreciate all the support. Until the next video, thanks for watching. Take care and bye for now. See ya. All right, that brings us on to the second setting and that's your shutter speed. I think most people are And with moving birds or flying birds, I generally try and keep it above 1 16th hundred. 1 16th hundred. 1 16th hundred. 1 16th hundredth of a second. I took another shot at... I took another shot at... <laughs> we, we lose another half. Alright, I've created a flow chart of how I go about taking photos in the field. First one is actually auto ISO exposure. That means the camera 
sets the final exposure. You set the shutter speed and the aperture and the camera will set the ISO. So the first step is to have a look around and determine how bright your scene is. If you're in a rainforest or heavily overcast skies, then I'd start with the dark settings of 1 3 20th of a second and maybe your lens's maximum aperture. I'll then half depress the shutter and the camera's meter will take a reading and set an appropriate ISO setting. If this number is higher than ISO 6400, then we need to decrease our shutter speed until that ISO comes down to 6400. If you had an older camera or you didn't want to use such a high ISO, you would lower your shutter speed until the, it hit the ISO setting you were comfortable with, maybe ISO 3200. Now if your ISO was lower than 6400, say 1600, then you can either increase your shutter speed or increase your aperture number until that ISO climbs back up to ISO 6400 or whatever it is the ISO that you want. So generally you'll want actually shutter speed before aperture and that's the one I'd recommend increasing first. As you can see as the brightness changes, the shutter speeds and the aperture numbers also increase and this is just because we've got more light available. Okay, this next flow chart is if I was using manual exposure. You'll follow a very similar path to the one before. You'll check the brightness of the scene. You'll dial in those recommended settings. The difference now is that I'll actually use a histogram to tell me the brightness of the scene. I did a video on histograms that you're free to watch, but I basically changed my settings until my histogram is exposed to the right and is showing a correct exposure. 